The tragedy of the commons is a really popular theory, but it actually relies on a lot of misconceptions, fallacies, and ideological biases. In this episode, we'll talk about some of the good points that this theory brings up, but we'll also look at some of the terrible problems with it. We'll also talk about why we should be highly skeptical about the so-called solution this theory says that we ought to apply to environmental governance and resource management. Many of you have probably heard of the concept called the tragedy of the commons, but you may not have heard some of the details, and more importantly, you may not have heard the many damning critiques of both the concept itself and the environmental policies that its supporters advocate. So today I'm going to talk about two things. First, we'll talk about the theory of tragedy of the commons itself in order to understand it on its own terms. Second, we are going to talk about just how problematic some of the assumptions are which underpin it, as well as how misguided some of its policy solutions really are. So step one, what is the tragedy of the commons? Well, this concept is most associated with the biologist Garrett Hardin, who published a paper in 1968 called Tragedy of the Commons. In this paper, he makes the claim that when resources are not controlled by any particular person, but are instead available for use by everyone, they will inevitably end up being overused, degraded, and destroyed. He believes this will happen because people make decisions as individuals, and the benefits of using a resource go to the individual, but the negative effects of using that resource are experienced collectively. Let's look, let's, uh, look at the example that Hardin uses to make his point, and let's use his own words to describe it. The tragedy of the commons develops in this way. Picture a pasture open to all. It is to be expected that each herdsman will try to keep as many cattle as possible on the commons. Such an arrangement may work reasonably satisfactorily for centuries because tribal wars, poaching, and disease keep the numbers of both man and beast well below the carrying capacity of the land. <laughs> comes the day of reckoning, that is, the day when the long-desired goal of social stability becomes a reality. What Hardin means here by saying, quote, the day when the long-desired goal of social stability becomes a reality, is that he is referring to the time when a once small social group becomes stable enough and has a population substantial enough to really fully exploit the resources of an area. At this point, the inherent logic of the commons remorselessly generates tragedy. As a rational being, each herdsman seeks to maximize his gain. Explicitly or implicitly, more or less consciously, he asks, what is the utility to me of adding one more animal to my herd? This utility has one negative and one positive component. Hardin then basically says, and I'm paraphrasing at this point because his language here is a bit dense. He says that for each animal that a herder adds to this pasture, they get the full benefits of that. The negative consequences of that animal's tendency to overgraze, however, is a negative that's distributed throughout the whole common pasture land and therefore through the whole society of herders. Hardin then goes on to say, Adding together the component partial utilities, the rational herdsman concludes that the only sensible course for him to pursue is to add another animal to his herd and another and another. But this is the conclusion reached by each and every rational herdsman sharing a commons. Therein is the tragedy. Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit in a world that is limited. Ruin is the destination toward which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. Freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. Hardin basically assumes that if an individual does not experience the full weight of the negative consequences of some action, which also gives them a lot of benefits, then they will act in ways that eventually destroy the resource in total for everyone, ironically, even for themselves. 
Why does Hardin and others who advocate this theory of the tragedy of the commons think that people will act this way? Well, because they believe that an individual herder only really has three options in this scenario. One, you don't put another animal in the pasture while everyone else does, in which case you lose out on the benefits of having that animal while still suffering the consequences when everyone else does it. Second option, you could cooperate and have everybody follow rules about how many animals to have. The third option, find a way for everyone else to follow a rule restricting access while you don't, and then you get to reap the benefits at everyone else's expense. Hardin and others then argue that a herder's most rational response is to choose the third option, and that this is true for all the herders. As Hardin puts it when discussing this, he says, If we ask a man who is exploiting a commons to desist in the name of conscience, what are we saying to him? What does he hear? Sooner or later, consciously or subconsciously, he senses that he has received two communications and that they are contradictory. One, the intended communication, which is, if you don't do as we ask, we will openly condemn you for not acting like a responsible citizen. Two, the unintended communication, if, we, if you do behave as we ask, we will secretly condemn you for a simpleton who can be shamed into standing aside while the rest of us exploit the commons. In other words, Hardin says that all the herders will so fear being a sucker that they won't dare follow consensual agreements with their fellow herders. They will instead make the decision that is the most rational for themselves as a fully independent individual, which is to get as much as they can and drive the whole system to collapse. So while the most uh, suggestive example that Hardin uses has to do with overgrazing, the real power of his argument is that he applies it to any kind of common resource like the Earth's oceans and atmosphere, where polluters benefit from being able to dump pollutants into them and whom the negative consequences from that act fall to everyone else. But in Hardin's logic, the polluters would be suckers not to do it, because others would benefit from doing it if they themselves did not. Hardin also applies this idea to the enjoyment of national parks where unrestricted access by hordes of tourists ruin the common tourism resource. Most importantly, however, Hardin applies this theory to the idea of having children. The issue of how to stop people from having children is the main point of Hardin's article, and he both begins and ends his article about it. To him, every person who is deciding to have children is using up and degrading common resources because, in Hardin's view, people only consume resources, they don't produce them. Hardin, the self-described genetically trained biologist, believes that a person benefits from getting to pass along their genes to their kids, and so he argues that people don't want to be a sucker, right, because you would be if you restrict your fertility while allowing other people's kids to come rule the earth. The result then, which is Hardin's biggest concern, is not just overpopulation, but overpopulation by what he calls, quote, parents who breed too exuberantly, and, quote, the children of improvident parents. What then does Hardin suggest as a solution to the problems of overpopulation, overuse, and environmental degradation? First, he suggests that commons ought not to exist, and that if instead you just privatize the commons, then individual actors would each feel the negative effects of their own overuse decisions more directly and personally, and they would then temper their behavior because both the benefits and consequences are experienced only by them. The second solution is that users of a common resource, be it the atmosphere, a pasture, or the global food supply, ought to be under some kind of authoritative power that restrains, coerces, and punishes people who try to use common resources, which in his view includes forcibly restricting childbirth. In his own words, this is the last paragraph of his famous essay. The only way we can preserve and nurture other and more precious freedoms is by relinquishing the freedom to breed. 
and that very soon. Freedom is the recognition of necessity, and it is the role of education to reveal to all the necessity of abandoning the freedom to breed. Only so can we put an end to this aspect of the tragedy of the commons. Okay, so that is basically how this theory sees the world, and these are the solutions it proposes. It says that resources being held in common among groups, or people having free access to resources, will inevitably lead to disaster, overuse, and destruction. This theory has been influential, and many policies and attitudes towards environmental management definitely still buy into this today. So, why is it a problem? Well, there are a few reasons to be very critical of this theory. Some have to do with logical inconsistencies and inaccurate assumptions that are in it. Some have to do with the fact that the world is actually filled with examples where common resources are managed quite well and cooperative management is not tragic at all. And there are also definitely, definitely. some incredibly morally problematic and downright cringeworthy views of people that Hardin professes and which are absolutely central to his flawed arguments. For instance, he straight up states that some people are genetically better than others and only those genetically better people deserve to be able to breed or have the right to manage environmental resources. More on that here in a second. First, however, let's start with a few problematic assumptions that Hardin makes. The first is that individuals make decisions in complete isolation from one another. This is usually simply not true. If we go back to the classic herding example, Hardin's theory assumes that every herder doesn't have any concerns other than their own short-term economic improvement and that they are somewhat oblivious to what the long-term consequences are to the landscape if a settled population overuses it. This is, of course, not true for a few reasons. While every person does care about making some quick cash, most studies show that people, including those who herd livestock, are very concerned about the long-term viability of their livelihoods, have quite detailed historical and geographic knowledge of their environments, and create all sorts of social strategies that are made in communication with other people around them to ensure long-term habitation and ecological sustainability. For instance, Hardin may think all our herders are completely independent competitors who will screw each other over if they can, but in most social situations, these people are actually in networks of interaction, such as kinship relations, systems of mutual aid, friendships, etc., where there are social pressures, as well as very real material and economic benefits to not being a total dick. Furthermore, Hardin's theory doesn't take into account that the people that have lived in a place for generations and who rely on common resources can tell when environmental conditions change and then they frequently can and do get together and adjust their agreements and practices to avoid a tragedy. This leads to the second main reason we should question the relatively abstract tragedy of the commons theory. This is that it is contradicted all over the place by actual empirical evidence that collective management works in a lot of places, and there is a lot of research showing that hardened so-called solutions to problems of common property management such as enclosing and privatizing everything, or relying on coercive state control, these both frequently lead to worse social and environmental outcomes. Now, this is true not just in terms of animal herding. All sorts of common resources are managed by social agreements. They certainly aren't all perfect, but there have been collective agreements to protect common resources that take place at scales ranging from the local to the global from community NGO or citizen-led initiatives to collectively clean up local waterways, to global accords like the Montreal Protocols that mitigate the effects of CFCs in the global atmosphere. Part of the reason for Hardin's misunderstandings of how common resources have long been collectively managed is that he and his supporters tend to take a very specific historical experience and claim it applies everywhere all the time. The experience that Hardin alludes to in his famous essay is the experience of what he calls plainsmen and the situation he imagines that plainsmen might encounter in the U.S. frontier shortly after European colonization and settlement. 
Hardin is essentially not trying to solve the problems of people who have resided in a landscape for generations and who have highly developed environmental knowledges, management techniques, and cultural practices. He is trying to solve the problems of people who show up in these landscapes and have none of these things. He is talking about the problems of newcomers who are trying to derive profits from a place and who at first did not have to worry about any kind of collaboration or social management because their numbers at first seemed few in comparison to what initially appeared to be limitless resources. Over time, of course, more settlers flooded in and this situation changes and Hardin believes that the problem which emerges is that there are now simply too many people. The problem, however, is not simply that there are too many people, it's that the people who have shown up lack the intimate knowledge of the histories, techniques, and cultural practices that allow a society to collectively manage resources in a sustainable way in that place. Any group of people who has lived in a place for generations, like many indigenous groups, they don't have the luxury of entertaining the fantasy that a common resource can or should be infinitely exploited by individuals. If, however, the newcomers are enmeshed in larger ideological and economic systems that value intensive landscape alteration, antisocial individual decision-making, and short-term profits over long-term resource viability, well, it can be hard for sustainable practices to take root. In short, Hardin and his supporters take the problem of a fairly small group of people in a relatively small time frame of U.S. history and claim it is a universal that applies to all times, situations, and landscapes. And that just simply isn't true. So the last point, or criticism, really, of Hardin's thesis and approach is that there are some serious moral issues here. And now, I'm not just trying to tar his morality in an effort to attack his ideas. Instead, we need to understand that some really messed up views of genetic racial superiority are central to his theory. Think I'm exaggerating? Well, in addition to the end of the essay, which we talked about earlier, where he says that societies must eliminate the freedom to breed, he also does have an earlier subheading in his essay simply called, Freedom to Breed is Intolerable. He also says that overbreeding by what he calls improvident parents could be ended if they just experienced the punishment of the starvation of their children. He also says that providing social welfare to families or races who, quote, adopt overbreeding as a policy to secure its own self-aggrandizement is to, quote, lock the world into a tragic course of action. There is more than a hint in his writings that people he perceives to be genetically superior should be allowed to privatize the commons and be the sole custodians of it because they are more fit unless they genetically mix with people he sees as being inferior. This idea, soaked in the oils of social Darwinism and colonial hubris, is exemplified by this quote from his essay. It seems to me that if there are to be differences in individual inheritance, legal possession should be perfectly correlated with biological inheritance, that those who are biologically more fit to be the custodians of property and power should legally inherit more. But genetic recombination continually makes a mockery of the doctrine of like father, like son. So, in other words, he is basically saying that instead of the resources of the world belonging to all of humanity, that genetically superior people should control the resources of the world as their own, and that these so-called superior men should pass that private ownership to their male heirs. But that when this supposed superman combines his genetics with a woman, it waters down his superior genes, so the perfection of his children, who now inherit all this power and control, isn't quite as good as it ought to be. Like I said, his calls for privatization of, commons, of common property, you know, get pretty damn cringeworthy. Okay, so what is the take-home point here? It is that, yes, common property resources can definitely be spoiled by overuse. However, the belief that these resources can only be saved by privatizing them 
and handing them over to the already powerful and supposedly more genetically fit settlers that may have made claims on them is wrong on so many levels. It is obviously immoral to assume large segments of humanity are genetically incapable of taking part in resource management decisions. It is also wrong to assume that human social groups can't cooperate and collectively manage common resources sustainably. The evidence shows that this has been done in place after place and over and over again for millennia. In short, the fact that commons exist is not the tragedy. Common resources like the oceans, the atmosphere, parks and reserves, grasslands and forests can be managed in ways that are sustainable and which balance competing social interests. The real tragedy is that people have been ignoring the evidence and believe that somehow we can't do that.